Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches is at the OSU Cimarron Valley Research Station in Perkins, Oklahoma, to give an update on how well cover crops and landscaping paper are suppressing the Bermuda grass in our Bermuda grass eradication study. We travel to Freedom Farms in Oklahoma City to see how they are combating hunger and other inequalities in the middle of a food desert. OSU area horticulturalist Jim Schreffler gives an update on the squash row cover trial in Lane, Oklahoma, and we hear the buzz on some local bees. back here at Cimarron Research Station to take a look at two more of our mechanical methods of controlling Bermuda grass in plots. Today I want to talk to you about one of those methods is sorghum sudan grass that we planted as a summer cover crop. Now the idea of uh, this grass is that it will go after the Achilles heel of Bermuda grass which is shade. So this grass as you can see is the same behind us, we just let it grow tall here, but it can easily reach a six foot height. Sorghum Sudan is often used in the agriculture industry as a summer cover crop, and it's also used for grazing or forage, but you can see here, we're not necessarily grazing it, but you can see why it is a grazing uh, grass because it so readily regrows. In fact, it gets kind of more clumping and you can see there's a lot of side shoots to it when you cut it back. So it not, it's nice because it really gets thick and that's what we wanted. We wanted to really shade out any potential Bermuda grass rhizomes that were growing in these plots. Now the thing is, is at this point we're nearing the end of the summer and so we've got to figure out what we're going to do with this cover crop. And really you can do two things. You can one, either cut this way back, shred it up and till it into the soil and then look at planting a winter cover crop if you wanted to do that. Now the concern is, is you want to go ahead and till that into the soil and let it set and kind of break down some of this biomass before you plant your cover crop. And so doing that, uh, you want to back up your calendar a little bit. So you got to think you want to plant your winter cover crop around September. So you're going to need to till this in in about August so that it has a couple of weeks to break down all of this biomass. In that time, we still have nice warm days that can often allow that Bermuda grass, the remaining Bermuda grass, to get a root hold. So you might be cautious of that. You might still have some of those rhizomes actively growing in there. The other thing that you can do with this is to really cut it severely back. Um, this is often done with either a um, flail mower or a rotary mower on a tractor. You would not want to use your rotary 21 inch home lawn mower. This stuff is just too thick to really cut it with a lawn mower. But a small tractor could cut this down, shred it, and then instead of tilling it into your soil, go ahead and plant your cover crop, interplant it. You would want to maintain this really mowed down to allow that cover crop to get that sunlight and to get established. So eventually the cool weather will knock out this summer cover crop while your winter cover crop will continue to grow. When you're choosing your winter cover crop, you also want to think about which one in particular you want to plant. So we're incorporating a lot of biomass that's going to break down and doing so it's going to tie up any available nitrogen that's already in the soil. So planting something like a legume such as crimson clover is going to allow it to have a little bit more nitrogen versus something else that maybe wouldn't have the nitrogen in there because it'll be tied up breaking down all of this carbon matter. 
So while sorghum sudan is often used in the agriculture world, it, it can be used horticulturally. And the reason why we did choose it here was not only to shade out the Bermuda grass, but it's a, a fierce competitor for that Bermuda grass because it is also going after any of the available nutrients and also the water because we have not irrigated this. So it's able to establish in a dry land situation, which makes it a nice cover crop for Oklahoma. Another method that we use mechanically in order to prevent Bermuda grass from growing or to suppress its growth was this paper uh, weed barrier. Now I've never been a fan of plastic weed barriers, but I really liked how this paper weed barrier performed for us. And in fact, it is OMRI listed. So if you're in an organic situation or you wanna garden organically, this is an approved organic uh, method. And you can see what we've done is we weighted it down. Now it does tend to kind of uh, break down faster when it's uh, kind of pressed against that soil with a brick or something like that. So it will tear. We've replaced this in a year's worth of time. We've replaced it three times. But you can see how it really has suppressed the growth of the Bermuda grass underneath it. And what I like about this is um, while we also experimented with cardboard out here, the cardboard tend to have a lot more gaps in it, which allowed for some of those rhizomes to grow through. Whereas this, you can buy it in whatever length and various widths. So the price depends on what size you're getting. It also has different grades of thickness to it. So um, you can see here, we've got two and they're exactly the same size, but that's just a heavy weight and a lightweight. So you can see the variability in the thickness of the paper. Um, and that'll also help prevent it from tearing. Now we did try holding these down with T-posts at one point, which those tended to tear the paper a little bit more um, with the, the pokey parts on the T-posts. But we did two different methods here using this paper. One, we tilled the grass underneath it. Um, this is one that was tilled. And then we also have plots where we did not till. So you can see how having this covered all season long, we really suppressed the growth of the Bermuda grass. Unlike the cardboard, we did not cover this with mulch. So it really prevented any of those outside rhizomes from growing in and getting a root hold on top of this paper. It also has a little bit more of a cleaner appearance, so you don't necessarily need to add the mulch on top of it. So this is a nice product if you're looking for an organic way of getting rid of Bermuda grass. We often hear about food deserts and how community gardens can make an impact in those areas. Today we're here in northeastern Oklahoma City to take a look at the five acre Restore Farms and see how they're improving the community around them. My name is Ann Miller. I'm the director of Restore Farms. Um, so Restore OKC is the umbrella organization for Restore Farms. Um, and Restore OKC's mission is to promote racial reconciliation and then to partner with our neighbors and the community to end the cycle of poverty that we see here on the east side. Um, so we do that through multiple facets because you can't end a cycle of poverty if you don't address lots of issues. So we actually have an arm that um, employs um, individuals, Restore Jobs. We work with the elementary schools here on the east side with Restore Schools. We have an arm called Restore Community that works with our community members. Um, 
And then our last one, other than the farm, is um, restore homes where we do basic home repairs in the neighborhood as well. The farm actually um, addresses the, the issue with, of food, um, because of course, if you've got a cycle of poverty, you might be worried about food. Um, and so we are working, our mission is actually to employ seventh through 12th grade students as interns. Um, we hope to bring them into the farm, expose them to as many different aspects of agriculture as possible, um, whether that's working in a traditional garden, um, in our greenhouse space um, with animals, um, or even broader if we're thinking about ag business um, or how to run a successful farm, um, how to market ourselves. Um, we want to do all of those things, help them figure out whatever it is they're passionate about, and then we hope to help them get a full ride for some form of higher education when they graduate. Um, secondary to that, we are working with our interns to, um, with the goal of ending the food desert um, here in our 73111 zip code, um, which is one of the largest food deserts in Oklahoma. So right now we're standing in our community garden. Um, we've got two amazing interns working in the background behind us. Um, and in this space, we actually grow food that we share with our neighbors. Um, so when we're not in the midst of the coronavirus, our neighbors actually come and work with us in the garden. Um, and then they get to harvest and take home. We've got amazing neighbors that come and pick for their other neighbors and make food and share it with them. Um, especially like if there's any neighbors that are shut in um, because they're older and, and sick. Um, and we hope to, in the spring, actually expand to the rest of our space and have an um, orchard uh, as well as like blueberries and blackberries and raspberries. So we've got fruit as well that neighbors can enjoy. Um, we also have a greenhouse, uh, which is really fun to get to work in that with our neighbors. It's an aquaponics greenhouse. Um, so just like hydroponics, we grow plants in a soilless media. Um, but with aquaponics, you introduce fish into the equation. So we have 2,000 um, awesome and hardy and cute goldfish. Um, the goldfish um, actually add their magical good for plants poop to the water um, and that gets filtered and then um, that's what we water our plants with. Um, so we have really happy plants. They're actually all growing in six foot tall towers. We've got 72 of those. Um, so we'll be able to produce a ton of food in that space and it's really fun with the interns to get to introduce them to a piece of technology that's pretty cutting edge in the world of agriculture. Um, it's a lot of how people think that we're going to feed the world in the future as the population continues to grow and we have more and more large cities. Um, we can actually grow a lot of food in a very small space with that. And then we're going to be expanding this fall and next spring to add more animals. So we'll have goats. Um, and then in the future, we may also add some pigs and cows. Um, and our interns are really excited about that because we've got some aspiring future vet vets uh, that cannot wait to work with more of the animals. Yeah, so we're super excited. Literally last Thursday, we got chickens. Um, so we have 50 lovely ladies that are gonna be producing eggs very, very soon that we'll be selling um, in our market grocery store that the interns also have been able to work in that um, and get some business experience. So last August, the last full service grocery store closed in the 73111 zip code. Um, and a few months later, we were able to open up a micro grocery store here on our property. Um, where our, our goal really is to provide um, good, healthy, affordable vegetables um, and fruits and other groceries to our neighbors so that they don't have to go across town, but maybe once a month. Um, some of our neighbors have an issue with transportation. Um, and so it's a three hour bus round trip bus ride to be able to get there and back. Um, so we're really excited for our neighbors to be able to come just down the road um, and get good food. So the farm started just uh, two years ago, uh, just over two years ago, and we actually moved onto this property two years ago this month. Um, so it's been really fun. We're so thankful to have a ton of amazing partners, um, organizations, individuals that support us um, financially and also with their time. And we've been able in those two years to um, build our greenhouse space, to start our community garden, um, to add the animals. Um, so it's been a lot of really rapid growth in a two year period. We hope this time next year, there'll be even more. Yeah.
We're here today at the at the West Watkins Research, Research and Extension Center, uh, located uh, just uh, 10 miles east of Atoka, Oklahoma, at, at, at the city of Lane. And uh, this is a, one of the OSU uh, experiment station research stations that, uh, that uh, a few years back was primarily a vegetable research facility. Well, times change and uh, this, this, this facility is now really primarily a livestock facility, but we still do have some, some uh, fields where we do vegetable research work here. And in fact, there's one part of the station that has been certified organic for, for over 10 years, and we, that is still maintained, and we do a little bit of uh, vegetable work there so also, uh, as well as some, some uh, bee work and, uh, and, um, and studies on, on uh, providing, uh, providing uh, nectar sources for honeybees. Right now, what we're looking at is a, a uh, uh, one of one of several trials we have going on in different parts of the state, where we're studying uh, how to how to uh, manage squash bugs in cucurbit crops. Uh, in this crop we're talking we're in today, this trial is in actually a yellow squash. Home gardeners, commercial vegetable growers that grow crops like this squash, uh, if you ask them if they've uh, they know what a squash bug is. Uh, they are kind of give you a funny look and they will say squash bug is one of my major problems. Squash bugs uh, here in Oklahoma, they, they, uh, they're just, the climate seems to be well suited to them and their populations can build up in these crops terribly. And many times if they're not controlled, they, they can actually kill the squash plants before you can even harvest anything out of them. So, so, uh, so dealing, managing your squash bugs is, is a necessary, uh, is going to be a necessary uh, uh, procedure or skill that you're going to need if you're going to grow these crops and, and especially if you're growing in, in uh, if you're in business to do it to make any money off of them. Now of course there's insecticides can be used to control the squash bug but there's some problems involved with that too. Uh, the way the way squash bugs uh, behave here in Oklahoma they overwinter as adults okay and you'll you can find them in brush piles and storage buildings and thing like things like that during the winter months uh, once springtime comes around, uh, they will they will come out of their overwintering uh, the, the overwintering location, and they're very specific for for plants in this family, the watermelon, uh, squash, uh, cucumber family, and they will they can sense from long distances where there's a crop actually crop growing, and they will fly to that crop uh, so they can 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 arrive there and begin to feed and begin to lay their eggs and start the uh, and start the generation for that for that summer. Now, so you might say, well, you just need to watch for those insects and when they get to your crop, treat with an insecticide. There's several problems there in that the adult squash bugs, they're not easy to kill with insecticides, okay? If you use the insecticides following the, the label instructions and all that, uh, it can be very difficult. Uh, part of the problem is when do you apply it? The squash bugs, they arrive at the plants. They're very secretive. Uh, many times your plants, will, there'll be a lot of squash bugs there, but they're down low at the base of the plant. And the grower doesn't even realize they're there until there's, you've already got a, a huge population there and already doing damage to the crop. So uh, another problem is, again, pollination, pollination is very important uh, in, in squash production if you're gonna produce any fruit, okay? If you don't have any pollinators there, uh, you can have beautiful plants and with lots of flowers, but you're not, not going to produce any fruit. So to get back to the problem with the insecticides, uh, when you've got all this pollinator activity going on on a daily basis, when are you going to apply the insecticides? Because the insecticides, while they will control the insect pests, they can also injure the pollinators. So and many, people, many people would prefer just not to use any insecticide when those pollinators are there. Okay. Uh, so we're, uh, we're looking at some alternative uh, methods to be able to manage these, uh, these, uh, these uh, insect pests and also taking into account the pollinators. Well, uh, one approach that we've been working on for several years now is to, to use uh, row covers, as you see here, uh, as a way of, and we, these, these covers are opened up right now, but uh, within in a little while, we're gonna close these covers back up and these plants will be entirely covered so the insect so, so the insects cannot get to the plants, okay, once they're covered back up. The idea behind this is to, uh, to keep them closed for basically about 22 hours a day. They'll be covered up. We'll open them for a couple hours in the morning 
at the time when the pollinators are most active, allow those pollinators to get in there, get to the, uh, get to the flowers and, and, and do, their, do their job, and then we'll close it back up. And actually with this squash, what we find out is by about 10 o'clock in the morning, the flowers are closing up anyhow. So, so we're really not, uh, th th that would be the time just you know, for several hours in the morning when that pollination takes place. So uh, now we've, uh, we've looked at several different angles as far as how, how to, uh, to use these row covers. Uh, again, looking at different ways to uh, provide that pollinator, uh, provide that access time for the pollinators to get through the plants. Uh, and again, this, like I said, this one, this, the method here is to open up the covers for a couple hours and close them back up. Well, one question that arises is, what are you going to use to cover the squash with? Okay, there's there's diff different kinds of horticultural fabrics fabrics and, and things out there that could be used. What we're doing with this trial, we're actually comparing two different types of what we call spun bound materials, and they're different weights. So one of them is one of them is heavier than the other, and then we're also looking at one which is a uh, a uh, actual a netting type material. Okay, again, just trying to see which ones uh, do the best job. We, we know that they'll all keep the insects out, but number one, it may be, it may be that some of them uh, uh, affect the crop growth and the fruit production nor uh, dif different than others would. Uh, another thing we've noticed is that with the netting one, uh, we, we have some powdery mildew in here, uh, in, in the squash here, and the powdery mildew seems to be much more severe where we've used the netting material rather than the, the fabric type materials. So. Uh, now, on the other hand, that earlier on, and again, we, we're again we're just collecting our data, so we don't have final results. But uh, something we noticed early on is the plants with the netting; they were they seem to be much more productive as far as fruit set and all. Uh, so, so the, the netting does have some benefits. But again, we later saw that it seemed to to encourage the pottery mildew more than the others. So. My name is Terry Cock and I'm from the Department of Integrative Biology. Today I'm going to talk to you about bumblebees in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, we historically have about 10 species of bumblebees uh, that are native to the state. You'll typically find about four or five, though, in the wild recently as the others are critically endangered or declining rapidly. Here today we have two female bumblebees. Um, they are both of the same species. They are uh, the American bumblebee. Uh, you can tell that they are female bees because they have pollen baskets on the side of them. Those are known as cobricular baskets. And any female bumblebee will have pollen matted on the side of their legs that they are collecting to take back to the nest. Bumblebees typically emerge in March and April. The emerging queens are coming from overwintering and they will build their own nest, typically in rotted out wood, um, leaf litter. You'll find them in your yard, usually in burrows, as they typically are underground. You will not find large nests like you do honeybees inside of trees. Um, they'll mostly be on the ground nesting. They do form a colony of about anywhere from 20 to 400 individuals, with the most common size kind of around 100 uh, working bees. The bees typically live two to six weeks, and they will have a life cycle from about March, the whole colony as a whole, from March until about September, October here in Oklahoma. Once they are um, into the later in the year, queens will lay eggs that have other female bees that can reproduce. These female bees will go off and find their own nest to overwinter in. So if you see a large bee in your yard, more than likely it could be a carpenter bee or a bumblebee. The difference would be that a carpenter bee is shiny on its end, whereas a bumblebee is fuzzy. Overall, neither carpenter bees nor bumblebees or any other bee in your yard is particularly dangerous, as if you disturb them, they will protect their nest, but they are crit critical pollinators for the native plants in Oklahoma and they are all declining, so 
if you do find bumblebees, make sure to take care of them and help them by planting native plants. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, Casey checks out the coleus that we planted last spring and shows how to carry them over to the next season. Mike Miller from Pond Pro Shop in Shawnee, Oklahoma, joins us with tips on appreciating algae, and we show how to repurpose cattle panels for easier picking for your pickles and salsas. We wish you health and wellness, and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.